so I will talk today about um, almost minimizers with free boundary. And this is part of a bigger project uh, that I have been working with uh, Guy David, Max Engelstein, and Tatiana Toro. So before I tell you about this almost minimizers, as I imagine some of you haven't seen almost minimizers before, I want to describe the problems that were minimizing problems after which the almost minimizing problems came from. So here um, we have, let's say, the minimizing problem, we are given a domain omega, let's say in Rn, which is bounded, connected, and Lipschitz. And we have two functions, q plus and minus, which we're going to assume are in L infinity, so bounded. And we are going to have a minimization problem. So our class of admissible functions is going to be the set of functions in L1 lock in the domain for which the gradient is in L2. And we are going to have a function u naught in this uh, admissible set that is going to give us the boundary data. And I want to minimize a certain energy, which is this J functional. So this gives us the gradient squared plus this Q plus function squared over the set where U is positive plus Q minus squared where the function is less than or equal than zero over the set of candidates. Um, but now restricting ourselves to all the functions that coincide with the boundary data on the boundary of the domain. Um, a little bit of nomenclature. So when Q minus, notice that Q minus is that function that goes in front of the characteristic function of the set where U is less than or equal than zero. So when that Q minus is zero um, and U naught, our boundary data is greater or equal than zero, we have what we call the one phase problem. And in general, we have the two phase problem. So in the case of the one phase problem where Q minus is zero, we have uh, what started by being analyzed by Alt and Caffarelli. And the first thing they did was they showed using, you know, direct methods of calculus variations that minimizers exist, first of all. Then if you have a minimizer of the one phase problem, you can show that, remember, our boundary data was assumed to be greater or equal than zero. Then you can show that the minimizer is going to be greater or equal than zero in the whole region. And then you're going to have some PDEs. So the function is going to be subharmonic in the whole domain, and it is going to be harmonic in the set where the function is greater than zero. And this turns out to be extremely important for the analysis of, well, we are interested in what's the regularity of this minimizer and what happens with the free boundary. I will tell you what the free boundary is. Um, but the fact that we have this minimizer satisfying PDEs is very important for that analysis. And when we get to the almost minimizers, you will see that one of the biggest challenges is that almost minimizers do not satisfy PDEs. So we really need to work very hard since we don't have all the techniques coming from PDE um, for this. Moreover, so still talking about the one phase minimizing problem. Um, our minimizer is going to be locally Lipschitz, which is going to be our goal for the almost minimizers as well. And if we assume that, remember the Q minus was zero, but if we assume that the Q plus is bounded away from zero, then if I pick a point on the positivity set, we can say that you evaluated at that point over the distance of that point to the free boundary. The free boundary is the boundary of the set where u is greater than zero. This is approximately one, which is telling us that as we approach the free boundary, we are growing like the distance to the free boundary. Okay. Um, this, then we also can say that the set where u is positive, so the positivity set is of locally finite perimeter, and the free boundary is n minus one rectifiable. So if somebody is not too familiar with some of these words, don't worry about it, but maybe just to mention a little bit. So to say that it's um, n minus one rectifiable means that I have countably many Lipschitz functions from Rn minus one to Rn. And I can cover my set, in this case, the free boundary, by the image of these um, countably many Lipschitz functions, except possibly by a set that has Hausdorff measure zero, n minus one Hausdorff measure zero. So this is what it means to be n minus one rectifiable. So here, if we look at this, um, we have some PD properties. Out of that, we say we get some regularity for the minimizers. And then we can say something about the free boundary. 
So this is for the one case. And by the way, if somebody has a question, please either ask Edgar or, or I don't know, um, because I can't see the chat at the same time. Okay, so just uh, to mention. Regarding the two-phase problem, so this was studied by Alt Caffarelli and Friedman. Again, using um, standard methods of calculus of variations, you can show that minimizers exist, first of all. Then again, now we have two phases. We have u plus and we have u minus. It is not necessarily true that u is greater or equal than zero, but u plus and u minus are going to be subharmonic. Remember again, the important part to have a PD and the function will be harmonic where it's positive and where it's negative. And we are not going to have any of that for our almost minimizers, okay? As in the case of the one phase, you can show that if you have a minimizer of the two phase problem, it is going to be local ellipsids, which will be our goal as well for almost minimizers. And you have a very similar analogy to the one phase. So if your Q plus and minus are bounded away from zero, both of them, then if you pick a point either on the positivity or negativity set, um, your U plus or U minus grow like the distance to the corresponding piece of the free boundary, are either the boundary of the set where U is positive or the boundary of the set where U is negative. And again, the positivity and negativity sets are locally of locally finite perimeter. So again, you extract a lot of information from the fact that you actually have PDEs there. Regarding the free boundary, we can say more. So let's talk about the one phase first. So here the free boundary gamma is the boundary of the positivity set. And this, this involves a lot of very interesting things. So if we have that Q plus, remember for the one phase, Q minus is zero. So if Q plus is holder and bounded away from zero, then for dimensions two, three, and four, the free boundary is C1 beta. So it's the graph of a C1 beta function up to rotation. So this means that you don't have singularities for dimensions two, three, and four. So may, maybe some of you are drawing some parallels to minimal surfaces, which is the case. And then for dimensions greater or equal than five, we can write our free boundary as a regular part, this R, and then a singular part S, and what we can say is that the regular part is a C1 beta and minus one dimensional submanifold. So that's great. And then S, where we don't know that much. We do know that it's a closed set that has half of dimension at most n minus five. And then the question is, do these singular points exist or not? And we can say a little bit, but you know, there are still open questions there. So for the two-phase problem, again, we have the free boundary, which is now the boundary of the positivity set union the boundary of the negativity set assuming that q plus and minus are holder um, here this is a technical aspect that's important in out caffarelli and friedman so the q plus and the q minus are not the same so q plus let's say is strictly greater than q minus and bounded away from zero then for dimensions two three and four as in the one phase the free boundary is a c1 beta n minus one dimensional submanifold, so no singularities. And for dimensions greater or equal than five, we have exactly the same statement. The free boundary can be written as a regular part and a singular part. And the singular part is closed with house of dimension less than or equal than n minus five, okay? So a little bit of history because I didn't say who did what. Um, and forgive me if I'm missing somebody. A lot of people have been working on this um, out and Caffarelli, out Caffarelli Friedman type problems. So for the one phase in dimension two, you have the work of Alt and Caffarelli. For dimensions greater or equal than three, you have work by Alt and Caffarelli. You also have Caffarelli, Jerison, and Kenick, um, who used the Weiss monotonicity formula to show that you do not have singular points in dimension three. Then you have Weiss who worked on this monotonicity formula that was very useful. And Jerison and Savin also used the Weiss monotonicity formula to show that in dimension four, you do not have singular points. In the case of the two-phase problem, you have in dimension two, out Caffarelli and Friedman, and for n greater or equal than three, out Caffarelli and Friedman, and then again, Caffarelli, Jerison, and Kenick, analyzing the singular points in dimension three and showing that they don't happen. 
and um, Weiss for the monotonicity formula and Jarison and Savin for dimension four, showing that they cannot happen either, the singular points. Then there is this very, very interesting example by the Silva and Jarison, which is like a relative of the Simons cone for some of you who might have uh, seen this from minimal surfaces. So they constructed a non-smooth minimizer for our energy in R7, for which the free boundary is a cone. So they show that you can have singularities for dimension seven. But notice that we know that up to dimension four, they do not happen. So the question becomes, do they exist in dimension five and six? And this is still something that people are interested in working in. So all of this to describe the minimizers, and there is some uh, very interesting, more recent results that I also want to mention. And this is a paper by De Filippis, Spolaur, and Velishkov. So here they consider a local minimizer of this energy. Um, if you look at this energy very carefully, I don't know if you remember the energy I started with. I started with an energy in which the characteristic function of the set where u was less than zero was not exactly that. I had u less than or equal than zero. So it was not exactly the same, um, but, so the point is that if you have a local minimizer of the out caffarelli friedman functional, it will be a local minimizer of this energy that the Philippis, Spolaur, and Velishkov considered for certain choices of Q plus and Q minus. So theirs also includes that case, but it's more general. And what they did was something that had not been done before for minimizers. So they considered points that are called two-phase points. So these are points that are both in the, let's say, positive free boundary and the negative free boundary, and you wanted to understand what happens to them. And they were able to show that, let's say you pick X0, which is in this uh, situation, so it's a two-phase point, then there will be a small neighborhood around the point um, such that the positive free boundary and the negative free boundary are C1 eta graphs for some eta positive. So the two phase points are actually regular. This is what this is saying. And they were able to say more. So for this more general energy. So the free boundary, let's say here I have a local minimizer of their energy then the positive free boundary can be decomposed into a regular part and a singular part. And everything that I'm going to say also holds for the negative part of the free boundary. And here you can say that the regular part is a relatively open subset of the free boundary, which is C1 eta for some eta positive, and all two phase points are regular. So you cannot have a two phase point that is singular. This is very interesting and very important. Then they could also say some things about the singular set, and we know that our two-phase points are not singular. Um, so the singular set is a closed subset of the free boundary, which has house of dimension at most n minus five. And now um, they are going to describe this n star, which is a critical dimension related to that cone example. So this number is between five and seven, and what happens is that if your dimension is less than this critical dimension, then you don't have singular points. If your dimension is exactly the critical dimension, then the set of singular points is locally finite. And if your dimension is greater than the critical dimension, the singular set is n minus n star rectifiable, and it has locally finite Hausdorff measure with this appropriate uh, dimension. So they were able to say things and the existence or not of these singular points for when you are between five and six, we still do not know. It's related to the existence of those singular points for the out Caffarelli and Friedman as well. So this is um, kind of touching all of this history. A lot of people have been very interested in discussing these minimizers for these types of energies. And here in this talk, I want to talk to you about almost minimizers uh, for related problems that are going to have variable coefficients. So before we get into the variable coefficients, I want to talk about almost minimizers. So here let's talk about the one phase problem and what it means to be an almost minimizer. So we're going to have the same assumptions, a bounded connected Lipschitz domain, a function Q plus in L infinity, and we're going to have our set of candidates, which is exactly the same that we had before. Um, and we are going to say that a function in this admissible set 
is a kappa alpha, multiplicative almost minimizer, if for every ball in the domain, whenever you compare that energy with this function u, with the energy for another function v that coincides on the boundary of the ball with u, you have an inequality, but notice that to be a minimizer, I couldn't have this kappa r to the alpha. So here I'm introducing an error. I'm saying it doesn't have to be just less than or equal. You can have an error, but the error is depending on the radius of the ball that you're looking. So if the ball is very small, the error is going to be very small, okay? And I want to also call attention to the word multiplicative, and that's because uh, at the end, I'm going to describe additive almost minimizers, which is a broader class of almost minimizers. That's the one that we actually dealt with. So here, um, the energy that I mentioned, this J energy, is the energy that we had before for the one phase, the Alt-Caffarelli problem. And we are looking at it in these balls of radius R centered at the point X. And you need to have this inequality for every ball that is inside of your domain. So if you have a minimizer, you are going to have an almost minimizer, but not the other way around necessarily. So for the two-phase problem, we're going to have the same idea. I'm also going to have this error that can be introduced. It's a multiplicative error. And the only difference is that now I have this J function at the bottom of the page in blue, which includes the two phases, right? So it includes where, you, where the function is positive and where the function is negative. And again, I'm looking at this kappa alpha multiplicative almost minimizers. So for every ball, you have to compare your function to every other function that has the same boundary data in that ball. And you have to have this inequality for the energies with the error that depends on the radius. So um, in 2014, Tatiana and Guy started looking at these almost minimizers, and they were able to show that for these kappa alpha multiplicative uh, almost minimizers, they are continuous. So first interesting thing. And actually, before I get into this, I want to mention that what you should expect is that up to first order, your almost minimizers and minimizers behave the same way. So if you remember in the case of the Alt-Caffarelli, Alt-Caffarelli-Friedman, we had functions that were Lipschitz. So we expect that our almost minimizers also will be Lipschitz. The challenge is that we do not have the PDEs to work with when you're talking about almost minimizers. So here, what they wanted to show was that if you have a large ball inside of your domain, whenever you pick two points in this ball, you can compare U of X and U of Y in this manner because U is an almost minimizer. And as I mentioned, the problem is that we don't satisfy a PDE, so you need to kind of just use the fact that you have an almost minimizer, which means you have to play with comparison functions in a clever way. And you have to really work hard to extract a lot of information out of that. So let me tell you a little bit what are the techniques that you do in this um, case of almost minimizers here for this simpler energy. So let me give you a little bit of the idea of the proof. If we think about it, we are, our main goal is to show that the function is Lipschitz. Our almost minimizer is Lipschitz, which means I want to say that the gradient is bounded. So what we look is this average of the gradient in L2 norm, and I want to be able to bound this omega function, which is the gradient. And I need to be able to do that in some kind of fashion that is going to be locally uniform. So the idea is, again, let me just give you some kind of um, droplets of the main tools that we have for almost minimizers is the following. So you look at this ball, let's say of radius r centered at x, and I consider a function that is harmonic and in this ball and coincides with your almost minimizer on the boundary. Now you have a lot of information about this ur star because this function solves a PDE. So because it's harmonic, if I look at the gradient squared, this is going to be subharmonic. So if I look at omega at centered at x, but with a smaller radius s, I can add and subtract the gradient of this harmonic function that coincides with u on the boundary of the ball. Then I can use the fact that s is less than r to get this first term on the last line of this line. And then for the second term, I'm using the fact that the gradient of our harmonic function ur star is subharmonic, so the gradient squared. 
So because of that, I can estimate that integral on a ball radius S as less than or equal than that on the ball radius R. And this is very important because I wouldn't have been able to say this for our original function. So you have to go through this of comparing with this other harmonic function in between. Now, on the next slide, what I'm going to do is, first of all, notice that this last term, I have the gradient of a harmonic function that coincides with u on the boundary of the ball radius r. So because u r star is harmonic, it minimizes the energy. So this last term is less than or equal than the same term, but with u instead. And that's because u r star minimizes the energy. So that means that we have to deal with the first term on this last line. And for that, we are going to use very heavily that our function u is an almost minimizer. So here, um, we just break um, this first integral in this way. This works because u r star is harmonic and they coincide on the boundary. Then you use the fact that you have an almost minimizer that gives you this inequality sign in red. But um, I don't have exactly that because if I look at the line before, I didn't have exactly the energy. I didn't have the terms with Q plus. So because of that, I have to introduce an error that is a error of order R to the N. Then I cancel terms that appear in both. And I end up with this kappa R to the alpha, the integral of the gradient of U R star. Again, this is a minimizer. So this is less than or equal than the same integral of U, gradient U. And I end up with this. So what we do is we use this estimate with the estimate that we had on this line, on the very last line. So I'm going to substitute that and check what this tells me for omega. And our goal for omega was to show that it was bounded. Remember, I'm trying to show the function is Lipschitz. So if I put everything together, I obtain this estimate for our gradient, basically average gradient in a smaller ball of radius S in terms of the gradient on a ball radius r. And at this stage, another very important tool comes into play when you're talking about almost minimizers, which is an iteration scheme. So you create a radius rj, which is r over 2 to the j, and you iterate this inequality so that you can say that omega on radius rj is comparable to a universal constant, omega at xr plus cj. And this allows you to say at the end that you can compare your gradient, average gradient, on a ball radius S by your average gradient on a ball radius R plus a log of R to the S. And that is the crucial estimate you needed to be able to show that your almost minimizers were continuous. What you have to do to, to, to show that it's um, Lipschitz is you have to work harder with all the errors that are introduced and control them better but the tools are the same. You have to be very clever with the comparison functions you use, and you have to use iteration schemes in a clever way because you don't have a PDE otherwise. So using these techniques, um, Guy and Tatiana were able to show that if you have an almost minimizer, then it's actually Lipschitz. First, you show that in the positivity and negativity sets, not across, across is harder. Then you are able to show that not only they are Lipschitz, but they are C1 beta in the positivity and negativity sets. And the proofs come from refinements of those ideas of trying to estimate um, the average gradient. And if we're talking about the two phase, things become a little bit more complicated. So let me mention something here coming from Alt Caffarelli and Alt Caffarelli Friedman. So if you have a minimizer, you have that it is locally Lipschitz. And the ingredients of the proofs were the fact that the two phases were subharmonic and the fact that the function was harmonic in both sets, the positivity and negativity sets, which we do not have at all. So this is a huge stumbling block. And then for the two phase, even in the case of minimizers, Alt Caffarelli Friedman noticed that they needed more. They needed something that allowed them to control what happens with the set where the function is positive with the set where the function is negative. So understanding the symbiosis between these two sets starts becoming really important. And for that, they proved a monotonicity formula. So they show that this function that appears here at the bottom is a function that is monotone non-decreasing. And with that, they were able to estimate 
and control what happens with these two sets where the function is positive and negative. So in the case of almost minimizers, Guy and Tatiana, again, wanted to show that you had something, a function was Lipschitz. But for the two-phase, they also needed something more. So they needed a version of this out Faraday friedman So they needed to understand what is the interplay between our old friend, this omega, the average gradient. But then they also needed to understand what happens with the average of u on spheres of radius r divided by 1 over r. And then that's where the problem comes from when you have uh, two-phase. You also need to understand what happens with the average of the modulus of u, the absolute value of u. So for the two-phase, because of this issue that you also need to understand what happens with the, the absolute value of u, they also needed an almost monotonicity of an out Caffarelli friedman uh, functional type for the two-phase. So let me very briefly mention what they kind of did. So they had to subdivide their analysis into cases. And again, it's all about the symbiosis within the average gradient and then this average of the function u on spheres. So in the first case, both of those quantities are large. That's the kind of idea. So they are both in a sense comparable. And in this case, you're going to be very happy. This is going to be the best case. In case two, your average gradient is very large, but your average of the function u on spheres is small. And in the third case, your average gradient is small. So let me tell you a little bit what they did. So in the first case, which means that both the average gradient and the average of u were large, they are able to show that actually, great case, you're not only Lipschitz, but you are C1 beta close to that point. And this is even better than what you expected. So in that case, you are very, very happy. In case two and three, in which either your average gradient is large and your average on spheres is small, or your average gradient is small, you have, to, you have this radius r, and you create rk, that is r over 3 to the k. And if you check if the pair x, rk ever satisfies case 1, if it does at any point, then you use case one and you show that close to x, you are going to be C1 beta and you are done. Remember, our goal was to show the function was Lipschitz. If it's C1 beta, you're very happy. If instead case one never happens, um, then you are able to show that the Lin soup of omega, and omega, remember, was the average gradient, um, is going to be approximately k for some universal constant. And that tells us that if x was a Lebesgue point of the gradient, then the gradient of u at x would be bounded by k, which is what we want. So the idea is, first case is excellent, then you have these two other cases, and either at some point you fall back into the good case, or you can still show that you're going to be bounded. And that's how they deal with um, the Lipschitz continuity. Now let me mention the following, that in case two, um, you really need to understand what happens with the symbiosis between the sets where u is positive and negative. So just this proof does not work for the two-phase. You need more. And you need more. And again, this turns out to be an out Faraday friedman type monotonicity formula. So they were able to show that in the case of almost minimizers, you have an almost monotonicity formula. So here you have the same functional, the out Caffarelli friedman monotonicity, and they were able to show that you don't really have monotonicity, but almost monotonicity. So you have an error that depends on r to some universal power. Okay. And this was good enough to address these problems that came in case two, when omega was very large, but m was small. Okay. So in terms of the free boundary, um, they also did some work, so there are things that can be said. So if you have an almost minimizer for the one phase, assuming that Q plus is bounded and continuous and bounded away from zero, um, they were able to show, and this is really important, you have non-degeneracy. So if you pick a large ball inside of your domain, then you cannot go to zero too fast. Basically, this is what this is saying. So your U of X will be comparable to the distance to the free boundary. It will be greater or equal than some constant 
times the distance. So you don't have degeneracy, and this is really important. Then they were also able to show more about the structure of the free boundary under the same assumptions. They were able to show that the positivity set is locally non-tangentially accessible. Uh, if you haven't seen these words, don't worry about it. We're not going to focus on that. They were also able to show that there is a Alfors regular measure supported on the free boundary in a small ball for every point on the free boundary. The free boundary is n minus one uniformly rectifiable. And here, uniformly rectifiable is in a sense a quantified version of rectifiability. And again, the positivity set is a set of locally finite perimeter. On the free boundary, they could do a little more. Um, for the two phase, assuming that q plus and minus are bounded, continues up to the boundary and bounded away from zero, the free boundary is locally Alfors regular and uniformly rectifiable. And now with, uh, so this is also with max, in the case of the one phase problem, they were able to say more. So they were able to say that if your Q plus is holder and bounded away for zero, then you have the same kind of structure of the free boundary that we had for minimizers. The free boundary will be a regular set, which is C1 beta, and it's going to be a singular set uh, which is closed, and the n minus one Hausdorff measure is zero. And they also can say that you don't have singular points for almost minimizers in the case of the one phase problem in dimensions two, three, and four. Okay. Um, and then there is also that analogy that is related to the cones we've described. There is this K star uh, critical dimension. Um, for which, and we know by the works of Caffarelli, Jerison and Koenig, Jerison and Savin and the Sylvans and Jerison, that this critical dimension is strictly greater than four and less than or equal than seven. And we know that if I have an almost minimizer for the one phase problem, assuming Q plus is bounded and holder and bounded away from zero, um, then for a quantity S greater than your dimension minus the critical dimension, the Hausdorff measure of the free boundary minus the regular part, which means the singular set, is zero. Okay, so they were able to say much more in the case of the one phase problem. The two phase problem really is quite challenging. So why did we care about this variable coefficient version of these almost minimizers? So if we think about almost minimizers to functionals of like Alt and Caffarelli or Alt and Caffarelli Friedman, with variable coefficients, these actually appear if you're looking at measure penalized minimization problems, for example, for the Dirichlet eigenvalues of elliptic operators. So let me mention a few uh, papers where this appears. So one example just to start is the Laplace Beltrami operator on a manifold by Lambole and Sicaldi. So here they work on existence and regularity of faber crumb minimizers in a Riemannian manifold. And we have more. So Starting with this variable coefficients in 88, Caffarelli started looking at regularity for solutions to free boundary problems for uniformly elliptic operators with C alpha coefficients. This is not exactly what we're talking about, but related. Then in 2018, the Quiroz and Tavares looked at um, a very similar energy in which you have a matrix with uh, holder coefficients. And they proved that these almost minimizers are regular so Lipschitz, away from the free boundary. And this is important because our work actually shows that it is Lipschitz up to the free boundary, so across, uh, for multiplicative almost minimizers of this energy over here. Then in 2019, there is a work by Spola, Ortrey, and Velishkov in dimension two, in which they look at, so their, their goal was slightly different. They assumed that almost minimizers were Lipschitz, which we show happens. And with that assumption, they were able to show that the free boundary for this multi-phase shape optimization problem um, is regular. And this uh, is something that they do in dimension two because they need an apiperimetric inequality that was only done in dimension two. So there is also the work of Lambole and Sigmaudi that I mentioned in which you have um, first Dirichlet eigenvalues of the Laplace Beltrami operator with a volume constraint. So this gives rise to an almost minimizer. Um, our work is regularity up to and across the free boundary 
for additive almost minimizers, and I will tell you what that is. So these additive minimizers include the multiplicative almost minimizers. We do this for any dimension. And um, there is also work by Trey from 2019 as well, in which he shows Lipschitz continuities of eigenfunctions on optimal sets for functionals with variable coefficients. So this is also related. So let me compare a little bit all of these results, okay? I know it's a lot of stuff. A lot of people have been working on this. So our definition of almost minimizers includes the one from the Kiroas Tavares. We prove Lipschitz regularity up to and across the free boundary in contrast to the work of the Kiroas Tavares. Um, in Spolawar, Trey, and Velishkov, the authors assume Lipschitz regularity, and we show that this assumption is redundant, so you can show that this is true. Um, it looks like the class of Spolawar, Trey, and Velishkov is not the same as ours, but it is, so we work with the same class of minimizers, of almost minimizers. And let me tell you a little bit what is actually that we've done. So I spent here 40 minutes talking about all the history of this problem because there's so many things. Um, so here I'm going to have omega in Rn, let's say n greater than two. And I want to look at almost minimizers of this energy. And notice here that we have the same energy as before, except I have a matrix A. So I have variable coefficients. I'm going to assume as before, the Q plus and minus are bounded. I'm going to assume that A has holder coefficients and it's symmetric and uniformly elliptic, okay? And I am going to work with almost minimizers for this energy. So now the challenge is that things start becoming technical. So let's understand the ideas instead of spending all the time with technicalities. We're going to have a set of candidate functions. They have to be in L1 and their gradients in L2, that's fine. Um, then I'm going to have this kappa alpha, but notice that the error I have in this line in red is not multiplicative anymore, but it is additive. So before I had an error that was of the type one plus a constant r to the alpha, and here I have this plus kappa r to the n plus alpha. Um, and the important thing that I'm going to show you, uh, well, mention in a, maybe a couple of slides, is that if you have a multiplicative almost minimizer, which is the one that everybody was working with, you have an additive almost minimizer. So our class includes all of those. Um, here you have also a version of this energy for the one phase, and you're going to have a version of the energy, this functional J for the two phase problem. And because we're working with variable coefficients, we started having to deal with a lot of technical problems that involved the region in which we were defining the thing to be almost minimized or not. So do we mean to be an almost minimizer with respect to integrals on balls or ellipses? And the ellipses are important because we have this variable coefficient, so we do a change of variables that transforms the balls into ellipses. So we have a definition that is for balls, but we also had to include a definition for ellipses. So here for the two-phase problem, I have the same definition for additive almost minimizers, just for the full functional, including the two phases, still including balls. And if I compare these definitions, let me tell you that multiplicative almost minimizers are additive. So our definition includes the one from Guy and Tatiana from before and the De Queiroz Tavares. And to show that multiplicative almost minimizers are additive minimizers, we needed to show that multiplicative almost minimizers had a certain uh, property to them that is here at the bottom. So I had to integrate over ellipses and show that we had this inequality. So this was um, something that had to be done, otherwise we would not be able to show that multiplicative are additive. Then to describe this definition too in terms of ellipses, I want to mention that because I have variable coefficients, I have to introduce these transformations, the change of variables. Don't worry about the technicalities, but the idea is there is a natural transformation that transforms balls into ellipses, reserving the centers. Um, the one thing that you have to keep in mind is that most of the things we did, they work really well if this matrix A is equal to the identity at a point X. But the problem is that this is in general not true. And it's, to be able to preserve that, you have to change A as well, depending on the point, do this change of variables for A as well. And this becomes a challenge when you're trying to show that the free boundary has regularity because you need to deal with two distinct points. Let's say X and Y, they're close together. 
but then you do not know that the matrix is the identity on both of them at the same time. So this was one of the real big complications of our analysis. Um, so here we need to work with ellipses as well because of the variable coefficients. And we introduced the definition of almost minimizer for ellipses in terms of addition, an error that is of additive type. So this is exactly the same, except instead of having integrals over balls, I have integrals over ellipses. And then for the two-phase problem, I have exactly the same idea, a definition of an almost minimizer over ellipses. So that is going to be here. So this is the almost minimizer additive for the two-phase problem with this additive error. And let me just mention that when the matrix is the identity, which means that in the minimizing case, we're talking about the Laplacian, but we don't have a PD, okay? The two definitions are the same. And we are also able to show that if you have a kappa alpha additive of almost minimizer for balls, it will be a additive minimizer for ellipses, but with slightly different constants, but we can control them. So that is fine at the end. Um, similarly, if you have an additive almost minimizer for ellipses, it will be almost minimizer for balls with slightly different constants. And if you have multiplicative almost minimizers, you have additive minimizers. So that means that most of the time we work with additive almost minimizers using ellipses, but there were many moments in which we had to kind of play between the two. So this was one of the big challenges. There are moments in which one is the appropriate way to go and other moments where the other one is the appropriate way to go. So um, this is a long slide, which is not so complicated. This is just saying, if I have an almost minimizer for ellipses, um, you can change the variables and now your changed function is an almost minimizer. That's basically what this is saying. It's just that the region, the domain changes and the functional changes a little, but that is all that it's saying. If I transform coordinates, your new function is still an almost minimizer. Um, and we were going to apply this endlessly to a specific um, matrix and the matrix is going to be the square root of our matrix A evaluated at a point X naught. And X naught is the point on the free boundary around which we're trying to understand what happens. So what we did was we showed that our almost minimizers, additive ones, they are continuous. Then we were able to show that they are Lipschitz on the positivity and negativity sets. We were able to show even better. They are actually C1 beta on those two positivity and negativity sets. And in the case of the one phase problem, Again, playing really hard with these comparisons with harmonic functions. And now we have to be really careful because our function does not satisfy that energy for the Laplacian in a sense, right? We have the variable coefficients, but we're still comparing it to harmonic functions. So we were able to show that the almost minimizer is Lipschitz. And here, just to mention a little bit like the challenges, we, our key step continues to be able to estimate our um, average gradient. Um, but because we have this issue with the variable coefficients, you have to really be very careful with the size of the ellipses. And this becomes a very technical problem since you have to translate your function to a change of variables. Um, you have to be very careful with the size of the balls. Our main goal is still to estimate the gradient, the average gradient, and to show that that is bounded. So in the case of the two-phase problem, we also had further challenges, as was in the case of the fixed coefficients, let's say the stable coefficients. So we also needed an almost outcafarelli friedman type monotonistic formula for our two-phase. And we were able to show that, again, it's not monotone, but it's almost monotone with an error that is of the form R to a delta, universal delta. And with this, we were able to compare what happens with the set where U is positive and the set where U is negative and take care of that case too. Uh, that was also an issue for us when we were trying to show that our almost minimizers are Lipschitz. So thank you so much.